Much of my work today, I guess in recent years, deals with the slavery system and the prison system, you know, systems that went seamlessly from one to the other, and pretty much telling the story. Uh, like with my show Rewind, was paralleling the systems and how we transitioned from one to the other, you know, how both systems were profitable, how both systems worked for some people and definitely not others. But uh, we've been a country that's been built on the labor of others, whether it be uh, the Chinese that built the railroads, you know, Chinese Exclusion Act or the cotton, indigo, rice and crops that were, you know, farmed by the slaves or, you know, or the many Japanese uh, immigrants that came, you know, that were also incarcerated uh, after World War II, after Japan was attacked. And um, so, but you also have to look at, you know, the legacy of this country as an entity, as the Trail of Tears with the Native American population. So all these things are, uh, are infused in my work right now. A lot of these things are uh, history that we weren't taught. And so my work around the slavery and the prison system and history that we weren't taught about is what I'm focusing on lately. And also women's issues as far as voting rights are also a big issue. Our juvenile system is pre-jail, pre-prison for young people. And uh, they want to get you into the system early. When I say they, we have a system that uh, we spend $180 billion on annually on the state, federal, and local level. And this is not an, you know, at that amount of money, it's not an accident. There are a lot of jobs. There's a lot of people that are making money from uh, the catering food service aspect, psychiatric service, the dental and everything. So in order to make sure that this system stays in place, they make sure that the recidivism rate, that's the rate of return to prison is high, and they're gonna make sure that there's going to be newcomers to the prison system uh, starting at an early age. So this system is rigged to start recruiting people. And um, now you've probably heard the statistic or the information that we decide how many prisons we're going to build uh, based on fourth grade reading scores. Uh, some say it goes even earlier than that, uh, looking at demographics, looking at unemployment in certain areas and uh, building prisons based on that information. So um, the US is 25% of the world's prison population, but we are our population is only 5% of the world's population. So. There's a huge problem there that we went from one industry of slavery to the industry of the prison system. But as far as youth goes, I mean, there's been attempts to stop building these youth jails here. And uh, I also live in Seattle. We stopped one from being built for a while. It only housed 100 beds and the uh, judicial facilities were also going to be housed there and at the cost of $210 million. And it was slowed down, but it's being built right now as we speak. So there's a lot of big money behind making sure that uh, juveniles are incarcerated in, in this country. And we have about, currently have about 4,500 juveniles in uh, adult prisons that are not counted in the uh, 28,000 that are in incarcerated. And I think there are around 34,000 that are in uh, situations that are not regular prisons that are not bars. So those, so we count a lot of these folks in different ways, but if you're incarcerated, if you're being detained and held in a place, that's a different form of incarceration. So I think uh, looking at a system, looking at juvenile uh, incarceration as if is the norm and it's not broken as a way we need to actually approach it. And I think following the money is an important way that we need to approach the system as well because uh, the cost of uh, incarcerating some youth is a lot higher than adults because they do creative accounting around, well, they need uh, schooling and they need more supervision because they're youth. But uh, the cost of incarcerating uh, each youth can go well over $100,000 a year. And that's creative costs, not actual costs. I think marches are great. I think it's great to bring awareness to any and all subjects. But I learned, um, I created this map called Proliferation. It's an animated map of the US prison system and it shows that we have a lot of prisons. Since, since 1976, we built on average one new prison a week. And I wanted to show and not tell. Uh, it's been used by uh, policy organizations. It's been used by individuals to show things. 
uh, to influence change because there's prison-based gerrymandering where prison populations are being used and manipulated uh, for political gain. So, and that has been changing. There's been uh, laws changing prison-based gerrymandering. It, there has to be some focus on changing policy and it needs to specify which policies that we want to have changed as far as the prison system and then figure out action items for those uh, policies, real action items. And those action items need to be really inclusive. They need to involve people within your community and also people outside of your community. There's a lot of money involved in any of uh, these broken systems that we have in our country, whether it be healthcare, uh, the prison system, uh, gun violence, there's, there's billions of dollars involved in each one of these systems. And taking the candy away from those folks is very difficult because they're playing, they're paying millions of dollars a year in lobbyists to make sure that these policies stay in place. So I believe in marches, but I think we also need to get lobbyists. We need to get people uh, who can look and take on um, unlawful policing. Uh, we need to hire lobbyists to look at how policemen are never held accountable for their actions. Uh, they need to be, uh, there needs to be some kind of mandatory uh, steroid testing of, of police officers. I think I mentioned that last time I was here two years ago and there's been no action done on that because uh, that's a very important thing because um, there, there are some people that had theories around uh, Freddie Gray's death that, you know, the, some of the poli uh, policemen, the bike officers, might have experienced some kind of roid rage because the, the severed of the spine might have happened before he was even put in the back of the truck. This is all theory, of course. But I think it's important to not just test policemen for, you know, marijuana or cocaine, but steroids as well. So I think you can march with a sign, but I think looking at the different policies that you'd like to, you know, change is, is very important. And working with organizations that have had experience changing those policies is also important as well. Um, the statistical information I use for my prison data is from the Prison Policy Initiative. And they put out some really comprehensive information each year. It's called the whole pie. So they have a lot of information around uh, statistics and data. Yeah. The system is based on profit. And if you want profit, it will work. It's a system that will work. Incarcerating people and forced labor will work as well. And um, I mean, if you look at Unicor, uh, they make furniture, they make mattresses, they make electronics. Uh, for schools, uh, they make night vision goggles and helmets. In the prison system, they're being paid between 33 cents and $1.24 an hour. It's a system that works. It, uh, it's a profitable system that works. Actually, Unicor is the 47th biggest military contractor. Uh, how do you counter a profitable system if you start looking at the human benefit analysis of your actions as opposed to the cost benefit analysis that we can change? But the basic structure of how we do things and who we're beholden to a lot of times uh, can skew our uh, thinking, our thinking that helps people. Um, for example, it, it's not a black-white issue as a lot of people would like to make it out to be. You can have just as much opposition and barriers that are created by people uh, of, of color or black people within a black community. Um, you know, with Freddie Gray, three of the six officers were black, you know, black mayor, black police chief, it doesn't matter. But I think the other actions that happen within a system, when people in power are able to make changes that promote equity, like uh, Mayor Pugh, who just voted down, who vetoed minimum wage change. That is one of the major things that creates this disparity in wealth disparity in opportunity. And if we give people jobs and give them, you know, a livable wage, we will see crime go down. We will see that disparity in wealth go away. It gets get smaller and smaller. But as long as we have people in power who are beholden to other business owners who don't want to pay a living wage, then it feeds into the whole system. The, the big problem of uh, the system that we have in place today where there's a disproportionality in wealth and there's a disproportionality in opportunity and there's a disproportionality in incarceration. 
And as long as we have selective enforcement of laws, uh, we're going to continue. Because you can tell someone that if you're black, you're eight times more likely to get arrested for a pot. But people, it just goes over people's heads. We know that there's racial profiling and uh, police stops, but it still kind of goes over people's heads. It's, it's just we still talk about these things, but there's been very little to address uh, bias in policing and bias in um, everything that we do in this country. Um, a lot of my recent work has been looking at the Negro as a problem. Ever since the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, the Negro has been seen as a problem. There's many books. Uh, one recent book that I just bought from 1907 called The Negro Menace to, Civil to Civilization. I mean, but I've bought a couple of dozen books around the Negro being a problem from the late 1800s to 1947. And there are a bunch of them that are written by medical doctors, professors, and other scholars, people you would not think would have this ideology around uh, folks. But how do you go and move forward if you're seen as a problem in society? And I don't know the answer. Uh, my answer to most situations is we need to look at the roots of our history and how this country was formed, how this country became a country. It was not founded on altruism and being kind. It was, it was brutality from day one. And I think we, if we learn the true aspect of uh, our true areas of our history and how we were founded, I mean, and, and to have some kind of reconciliation, we can actually move forward. But, but if we keep pretending on being this God-fearing country where every person uh, was uh, treated fairly and equal, when we have this history of lynching in the country where over 5,000 people were lynched from late 1800s to 1947, and no one was ever prosecuted for those lynchings, uh, we have a problem. And people that are still alive today that were part of those lynchings like the woman that was part of uh, Emmett Till's killing, who just confessed that you know it was all made up. This young man died and was murdered and lynched because she made up the story. So I think we really um, have to look at ourselves, and it's like an alcoholic saying they're an alcoholic. You know, in America saying you know we we were founded on racism, sexism, and exploitation of people, and. It kind of goes against when you're a kid, when you're told that if you do the right things, good things will happen to you. You know, do unto others as they do unto you. I think, I think it, we have to really take a deep look at ourselves and who we are as a people and how we got here. And then we may, we may be able to move forward in uh, reconciling and um, actually creating a place that, you know, where there is true justice for all. Mm -hmm.